know what it is us 21st century humans value, crave, and worship above all else? The thing we seek out, minute by minute, 24-7, 365 days a year? Well, an idealist might say the answer is love, or maybe happiness. A cynic might say money, or power. But I'll tell you what I think. After watching my fellow bipeds shamble around this spinning rock low these many years, I say the deepest human impulse, the most profound desire and need, is for communication. But right now, at this moment, communication is changing. In the old days, the way our culture talked to itself, all the stuff we read and watched and listened to was controlled by the bigwigs who ran newspapers and TV networks, the movie bosses and music moguls. The big shots decided not just what information you could have, but when and where you could have it, and how much you had to pay for it, too. I'm John Heilman, and I'm here to tell you about a communications uprising that's happening all around us, an incendiary revolt of the little guy that has the assembled forces of big media quaking in their tasseled loafers. A revolt being propelled by, what else? The World Wide Web. To bring you this tale, I've explored the infinite expanses of the internet, from its busiest quadrants to its most barren haunts. I've skulked around behind the scenes in Silicon Valley, delving into the doings and meetings of the leaders of a new generation of companies like YouTube, MySpace, and Facebook, companies that have begun to turn the web into a two-way, participatory, democratic medium, controlled by no one and shaped by everyone. In other words, our medium. I've also delved into the history of the web to tell you the story of how the seeds of this remarkable transformation were sown. By now we all know how the web has changed the world, but this is the story of how the world is changing the web. This is Silicon Valley, California, and these dudes are Chad Hurley, Kevin Rose, and Jay Adelson. Now, they may look more like Doogie Hauser than Che Guevara, but these guys are among the leaders of the Web 2.0 revolution. Rose and Adelson run Dig, a social news website, the content of which is chosen by its devoted user community of millions. Hurley, meanwhile, is the co-founder of one of the planet's most insanely popular websites, YouTube, the online video sharing service that was bought by Google in 2006 for a jaw-dropping $1.65 billion. Now, you might think that like other startup players, these guys are in it to get rich. And yeah, they are. But they're also on a mission to change the world through web-enabled people power. I think it's just, this is what the Internet's all about. The Internet's about connecting individuals or connecting individuals to information. Who do you trust more? Do you trust some corporate executive in some smoky-filled back room, or do you trust your peers and the people who are connected to you? If that sounds like fighting talk, that's because it is. Dig and YouTube are part of a new wave of web services, each more popular than the last, all of which offer an alternative to old-school media, <laughs> like the one you're watching right now. Until very recently, the old television order operated according to a set of ancient and antiquated customs. Incredibly charismatic and slightly obnoxious, guys like me would travel around the world with huge expense accounts and even bigger salaries, getting ourselves filmed by guys like these. For the average person, the TV industry was impossible to get into. It was a clubby system that decided on its own what would get on the air. Them two, in other words. But not anymore. Today, the TV industry is being blown wide open, made accessible to everyone, all because of YouTube and a transformation summed up by its two-word slogan, broadcast yourself. Before, it was just the traditional media companies that would control um, the gates of distribution. And also, they were controlling what was being produced. Um, but we think everyone has an opportunity or um, should have the ability to be heard. It's not surprising that some of the titans of television find YouTube so threatening, especially after its marriage to Google. For what Chad Hurley and his gang have done is given us all a power that used to reside only in the hands of the masters of big media. They've given each and every one of us our own personal broadcast tower from which we can transmit our home video creations, be they brilliant or utterly moronic, to a potential audience of millions. Over at Dig, a similar kind of experiment is underway, 
Only here the subject isn't frivolous TV entertainment, but that most self-serious of subjects, news. Like a newspaper, Dig is full of the latest goings-on from around the world. But what lands on Dig's front page isn't decided by some stripy-shirted, ink-stained Ben Bradley wannabe. It's decided by you, the user. The more people who dig, which is to say vote for, a given story, the more prominence it gets on the site. You know, it's always been a handful of editors that determine what belongs on the front page of a newspaper or anywhere else. Now it's the entire, you know, close to a million registered editors that we have that are constantly looking for great news information, stories, videos, and anything else to expose to the community. What Dig is doing is it's saying a blog could be on the same plane as the New York Times. And it's up to the people to decide what's important. The guys at both YouTube and Dig are believers in a theory known as the wisdom of crowds. They're also deeply in touch with the fact that we love nothing more than the sound of our own voices, the sight of our own images on a screen. But there may be nobody who understands all that more deeply at this moment than this kid, Mark Zuckerberg, the 22-year-old founder of the burgeoning social networking site Facebook. The reason why you spend so much time communicating with your with your friends, right, and, and other people that you respect is because their opinions and what they say actually means a lot to you. So what we've tried to do at Facebook is we've tried to map out all of these relationships that people have. About a year ago, I happened to share a cross-country flight with Arthur Sulzberger, the chairman and publisher of the New York Times, and Mark Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg arrived about 20 minutes late to the New York Times jet, no less, wearing a pair of gym shorts and flip-flops. Listening to him and Salzberger talk about the future of media was like overhearing a conversation between a Martian and a fungo bat. When the flight was over, Salzberger asked me what I thought of Zuckerberg, and I said I thought he was smart, but young. Salzberger replied, yes, yeah, smart, but really young, and really, really lucky. He said he was just the flavor of the month. A year later, the New York Times' share price and profits were falling through the floor and the company was conceding that its web strategy was a total mess. Meanwhile, Facebook was growing like gangbusters, getting ready for what was sure to be a multi-billion dollar IPO, and looking, quite possibly, like the next Google. But the truth is, Facebook and YouTube and MySpace and Dig didn't come out of nowhere. They're the direct descendants of another crop of media revolutionaries, who hit the scene an eternity ago in high-tech terms, by which I mean, you know, a little less than a decade ago. Now today we've all become a bit blasé about the web. We take for granted the huge changes it's caused in our daily lives, especially when it comes to how we consume media. But take a second and cast your mind back to, say, the mid-1990s. Remember how it used to be. Remember the incredibly tedious process that used to be involved when it came to laying your hands on a new piece of music. As I recall, it went something like this. First, you'd hear a track you liked, maybe on the radio. Then you'd have to leave the house and go look for a record store. Poke around in the bins, find the music you're looking for, and then come all the way back home again. Finally, you'd get back to your comfy living room with your expensive new CD, which you'd bought on the strength of that one single you liked. You'd pop it into your CD player, put your feet up, and give it a listen. And more often than not, you'd find out that the rest of the CD was complete and utter crap. But that's the way it was in those days, and there was nothing you could do about it. Or at least that's what most of us thought. But tucked away in the college dorms and suburbs of America were some folks who thought differently. The nerds in question were guys like David Weekly, Justin Frankel, Cable Sasser, and Steve Frank. Music lovers who started playing around with some obscure technology that put tunes together with PCs and the web. I think most people weren't ready for the idea that real music could come from their computer and they'd actually be introduced to new music through their computer and through the internet. I mean, most computers didn't even have speakers that came with them. It's kind of an exciting time because it was the beginning of that music revolution and you could feel that it was changing. You could feel that something big was going to happen. I made software for playing music that was really low quality and, and on homemade hardware uh, in high school. And then by the time I was in college, um, MP3s sort of were available. Uh, so I started playing around with that and the quality was actually really good. 
In the old days, music files were huge and unwieldy, but MP3 provided a way of compressing the data in a much smaller digital packet, and therefore making it easy to move back and forth around the net. Turned on by the possibilities of all this, Frank Sasser and the 18-year-old Frankel went and created downloadable media players Audion and Winamp, applications that allowed users to store and play music in the form of MP3s on their computers. But that was just the start. Music lovers and internet enthusiasts like David Weekly were getting excited about the idea of distributing and accessing MP3s online. As a Stanford computer science freshman, Weekly launched an MP3 information website laden with downloadable ear candy. About two weeks after I started it, I got a call from Stanford Network Security. And they asked me, hey, what's going on? We keep this list of the top 10 to 20 servers on campus uh, that are using bandwidth. And normally dorm computers aren't really on this list. And your computer's number one in this list. And actually, your computer's using about 85% of Stanford's outgoing network bandwidth. So we're curious, what's going on? What was going on was the first stages of an internet insurgency that would soon catch the old order of the music business totally off guard. For down in Los Angeles, executives like Jay Samet of EMI Records had created a cushy life for themselves doing things the same technophobic way that they'd always been done. MP3, web audio, ripping, mixing, burning, their reaction was, not a chance. The record industry as an industry, all the labels working together, funded a project called Madison, which was a test with IBM to put CD burners in people's homes. This was a test done in San Diego to see would consumers purchase and download and burn music. And the, 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 the conclusion of this very expensive test done by, by IBM and these major record labels was that no consumers would ever want to do this. And what a brilliant insight that was. It's worth recalling, of course, that a couple decades earlier, the geniuses at IBM had decided that the worldwide market for PCs would never be more than a couple thousand units. And now the dinosaurs of the record industry were making the exact same mistake again. Instead of, heaven forbid, embracing the net, the music business fat cats adopted a posture of perfect and absolute denial. Under no circumstances would they allow any of the copyrighted material of their artists to be circulated anywhere on it. But as the industry would soon discover, like every other parent eventually does, the kids of America didn't really care whether they had permission or not. The idea that music could be distributed on the web and freed from the rule of the record industry was about to go mainstream in a massive way, amidst a frenzy of downloading that would ultimately pave the way for services like YouTube. All this thanks to a shy 18-year-old from Boston with a novel but thoroughly disruptive software idea. His idea was called Napster, and his name, Sean Fanny. Back in 1999, Fanning was studying at Boston's Northeastern University. He liked to play guitar, and like his friends, surf the web for downloadable music. My roommate in, in, in college was really into rap music and would download all sorts of obscure rap, and he'd have his friends over on the weekends, and we'd party, and they were all interested in getting access to his music and, or figuring out how to get music in the same way that he did. But he put so much time into finding tracks, it was such a pain that he would skip class to do it. And if he found a good site, he would, he would skip you know, an entire day worth of classes just to make sure he got everything he wanted. This gave Sean Fanning a big idea. I mean, like, really big. So big that its repercussions are still rippling all throughout the internet and the entertainment industry today. I started to come to the realization that there were all these people with music collections um, that had music that other people would be interested in and they wanted to share them. And the logical way to solve that and some of the reliability issues was to do something that created what was essentially a peer-to-peer -peer architecture. So how did this peer-to-peer -peer system work? Well, Napster allowed its users to let their PCs talk and share stuff with the computers of other users. This meant that as long as someone somewhere had an MP3 of the song you wanted, all you had to do was fire up Napster, type in the name of the song, and it would be downloaded onto your hard drive straight from theirs. Napster was kind of built out of necessity. I, I was... I, I really wanted to use what I was building. And he wasn't alone, because Fanning, a kid too young to buy a drink in most American states, was about to spark a phenomenon and cause one of the most heated controversies in the history of technology. In June 1999, Fanning finished hacking up the code for Napster. It was the first program he'd ever written. 
He gave it to a couple dozen of his friends that he met through online chat rooms and told them, hey, just don't spread this around. But once they got their hands on it, they couldn't resist. Within a week, some 10,000 people had downloaded Napster, unleashing a revolution that promised a future in which the record shops of the world looked something like this. We just had an explosion of downloads and the network started to go crazy and um, from there on it was a blur. College kids, forever on the prowl for anything free, were the first to catch the Napster bug. In the next few months, the program raged across American campuses and by October of 1999, Napster-driven MP3 downloads were taking up 75 to 80 percent of the available bandwidth of many U.S. universities. In less than four months after Fannie released it, Napster had passed the million download mark, making it the fastest spreading software ever. For many, the equation was dead simple. Napster equals free music. But what Fannie had created had implications that went way beyond music. He created a means of turning users from passive recipients of information into active and engaged participants, announcing their tastes, sharing their most prized possessions, and talking to each other about their greatest passions. And in the process, they were becoming one of the first genuine web communities, something that countless sites in the future, from Friendster to MySpace to Facebook, would try eagerly to become. It was one of those things where just something as simple as seeing someone downloading a particular track from you and being able to right-click on them and message them and, and talk to them about the track um, was something that became so powerful, and it wasn't really possible before, uh, before Napster. With Silicon Valley venture capitalists pounding at the door, Fanning picked up and moved out west to California turning Napster from a hobby into an official business. The future looked bright for the fledgling service, but there was just one little problem. Napster's unprecedented success hadn't passed unnoticed by Hillary Rosen, the head of the Recording Industry Association of America, an organization set up to represent the interests and protect the revenues of the music business. Rosen was known as one tough cookie, and she wanted a word with Fanny. We called Napster. Um and said, wow, cool idea. Did you know it's illegal? And uh, really, really, no, it can't be illegal. This, you know, this is, well, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe it is. Tell us what you want us to do. He says, well, you're really going to have to filter out the copyrighted songs on your site. Well, how do we know what's copyrighted? Well, pretty much if it says Rolling Stone, if it's a Rolling Stone song, you can imagine it's copyrighted. It didn't matter how cool and cutting edge it was. As far as the music industry was concerned, using Napster to trade files online for free was the same as going into a record store and stealing a bunch of CDs. And with millions of files being traded online every day, this was shoplifting on a vast and epic scale. It was only a matter of time before someone said enough's enough, threw down the gauntlet, and tried to take Napster down. But as it turns out, that person wouldn't, at least at first, be the RIAA or some music industry executive. Far from it. These golf club wielding fellows are Howard King and Peter Paterno, top Los Angeles entertainment lawyers. Back in the summer of 1999, King and Paterno looked up one day and glimpsed the arrival of Napster, the renegade web file sharing application that they realized had enormous implications. Well, you know, the whole file trading phenomenon uh, was uh, starting to sweep mostly college campuses and music was getting exchanged and nobody was paying for any of it. Golf is so rock and roll. It's like, let's see, I got, I got 20 bucks, I could buy a CD or I could buy enough weed for the weekend. Well, I can download, this, I can download the music and I can still buy the weed. All right, I'm in. I thought, okay, but fine, they're swapping these MP3s. You know, college kids will steal it and, you know, won't catch on. But really, within a week, we understood how big it was. Once we went public and people started coming to us with technical information and, and, and stories, we realized that this really was uh, not only the potential end of the music business, but the end of the movie business and the book business, and really the end of protection for intellectual property. We, we understood within a week that this was a, a, a huge genie that had been let out of the bottle. And boy, was he right about that. Though Napster may not have actually put an end to intellectual property, it had set music free, breaking the distribution monopoly exercised by the record business. All of a sudden, millions of kids were swapping songs willy-nilly, threatening to cut out the middleman, 
and eliminate the profits that paid for the Ferraris and fancy country club fees of the suits who ran the labels. But it wasn't just the suits who were in danger of taking a hit, it was the artists too. So King and Paterno set their sights on them, trying to persuade their superstar clients like Dr. Dre that Napster and the internet were a clear and present danger to their bling. We actually took a laptop to the uh, studio and we said, Let, let's show you how easy this is. Dr. Dre, Broom. every song he ever recorded is on there and, and there's all kinds of versions of it. And then, you know, you can see in, in those days for every song there might be, uh, you know, 5,200 people offering it for free. He uh, got it and uh, he goes, so, I work 24-7 in the lab, I come up with stuff and they can steal my the day it comes out, because that. Now the language that Dr. Dre used may have been ghetto, but the sentiments he was expressing were 100% corporate. Suddenly he and his crew were reading up on copyright law and starting to realize that the very future of intellectual property, the thing that allowed them to rake in the Benjamins, was at stake. And there was worse to come because Dre wasn't the only one of Paterno and King's superstar clients to notice that their music was being traded for free by a Napster. Sean Fanning's little invention had also caught the attention of the biggest, ugliest, hairiest, and scariest, and richest heavy metal band of them all, Metallica. And to put it mildly, they were not amused. I, I was a pretty big Metallica fan, and um, I remember being really surprised by the fact that they were so upset by Napster and uh, by um, people sharing their, their music because I know they were really into um, you know the uh, taping of live shows and sharing of live shows. They were pretty hypocritical. Yeah, I'd say it was, it was pretty hypocritical. On May 3rd, 2000, Metallica's drummer and de facto spokesman Lars Ulrich arrived here at Napster's San Mateo headquarters on the northern edge of Silicon Valley. He was flanked by his lawyers, Paterno and King, for what would turn out to be a legendary, or ludicrous, depending on your point of view, encounter with their digital nemesis. I think he expected to come there and find like a big company with like a big sign out front with its own separate building. And he came there and it was like one small office with a couple guys um, in a bank building. And so I, don't, I really don't think he knew what he was getting into. We let the press know, but I have to tell you, when we rounded the corner, in front of Napster's headquarters and saw at least 250 reporters with all the trucks in the towers, we were all shocked because that was the first real sign that this is a pretty hot issue. Ulrich and his lawyers were here to make a point. They wanted some 300,000 Napster users, all of them trading Metallica songs, to be banned from using the site. And in case there was any doubt about who those users were, they brought with them a stack of computer printouts listing the names and details of each and every one of them. There were people outside with signs and smashing Metallica CDs and it was, uh, it was pretty funny. It was a cutting edge issue with quality clients and, you know, substantial intellectual issues. It's a great experience for a lawyer. And, and, and we were right. <laughs> oh yeah, we had the added convenience of being correct, something as lawyers we don't often have. They may or may not have been right about the law, but they definitely were not cool. The furor over the Napster Metallica war boosted Napster's popularity even more. Its user base was exploding. Sean Fanning had become a cult icon, worshipped by kids all over America, while Metallica was left looking like a bunch of greedy Luddites, and worst of all, totally square. But there was more trouble to come. Hillary Rosen and the RIAA filed a lawsuit against Napster, one that promised to have profound implications for the role of copyright in the digital age. After a furious, bitter legal battle that took place here at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals amid a massive swarm of press from around the world, in July 2001, a verdict was rendered. Napster had to be shut down immediately. The music business had won, at least for now, but it had also shown itself to be a reactionary force. Rather than embracing the future, it had panicked and declared war on its customers calling them outlaws rather than what they really were, fans. With its vindication in the courts, the music industry could claim a victory in its war against file sharing. It had shut down Napster and sent Sean Fanning packing. And it encouraged Steve Jobs and Apple to create the iTunes Music Store, where songs were sold for 99 cents a piece, 
with strict copy protection that made the labels very happy. But with the benefit of hindsight, the music industry's alleged triumph seems more like a hollow Pyrrhic victory. Did shutting down Napster halt the decline in music sales? Mm, no. They just continued their long and steady downward spiral. Did shutting down Napster stop illegal file trading in its tracks? Mm, no. Services like Kazaa simply picked up where Napster left off, fueling even more trading in pirated tracks. Well, okay then, you might say, at least the lawsuit sent a shot across the bow of Silicon Valley on behalf of the entire entertainment industry, a stern warning to every impudent punk kid that trading in copyrighted material would not be tolerated. But while the courts may have said that Napster broke the law, it also broke new ground. Ground that a new generation of 21st century web startups would soon rapidly lay claim to. The best known of those startups, of course, is YouTube, which in the past couple years has become a worldwide sensation, in no small part by being a place where people can go to view countless clips from popular TV shows. Shows produced and owned by giant media companies such as Viacom. So how have those companies reacted to this uh, borrowing of their content? Well, recently I interviewed Philippe Dalmon, Viacom's CEO, and what he had to say about YouTube carried distinct echoes of the Napster controversy. Well, it's a very high quality company, a lot of very, very smart people. They can do things very quickly when they want to. And uh, I guess they haven't wanted to until this point, but maybe they will want to in the future and will want to join the consensus that uh, they so need, need to be a part of. Daman's obvious unhappiness has expressed itself in legal form. Viacom has launched a $1 billion lawsuit against YouTube, accusing the site of, quote, brazen disregard for intellectual property law because of the copyrighted material that appears on the site. You might be tempted to ask, have these people learned anything? And to answer, I guess not. Even though YouTube will take down any copyrighted material as soon as the owner asks it to, and even though YouTube is trying hard to come up with an easier system, Daumann's fears seem undiminished. But bringing YouTube to heel won't be as easy as shutting down Napster was. Because unlike Napster, YouTube is no longer some underfunded startup. It's got a deep-pocketed sugar daddy in the form of the search giant Google, which acquired YouTube at the end of 2006. I think it, it definitely would have been hard, to say the least, without Google's resources in place to, to deal uh, you know, with the, the level of you know, interest in our company from the, the larger media players. YouTube may have become the largest target of the old guard's attempt to protect its flank. But while the service has indeed become a place where millions of people post and share copyrighted material, that may not be the most significant threat that YouTube poses to big media. Yeah, I think what they're feeling is just the effects of the internet, is that the internet opens up new opportunities for distribution that they don't necessarily control. And people have the opportunity to create their own content. And people are entertaining themselves. I think at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. Sometimes they, they feel threatened by the fact that, that people would rather watch themselves than to watch their content. From its inception, YouTube has been at the forefront of the movement towards user-generated content. It offered a platform for people to express their creativity and indulge their vanity, and people went wild for it, posting countless online videos of wildly varying quality. But YouTube wasn't alone. With the rise of sites like Craigslist and Flickr, Dig and Match.com, posting online video was just one of many ways in which people became active players in an increasingly two-way web. They shared their music. They sold their stuff. They posted pictures of themselves when they tried to get a date. With this shift in attitude, a new era began on the internet, an era where content was created by the crowd in all its wisdom and stupidity, an era that would come to be known as Web 2.0. The phrase means different things to different people, but no one has been a more pivotal theoretician of it than Fred Wilson. Wilson is a New York venture capitalist, a very rich man, and the backer of such cutting-edge Web 2.0 services as Delicious and Twitter. He's also a highly respected blogger who draws a large audience of people eager to listen to his musings, not just about money and investing, but about the meaning of it all. The fact that the people who are firing up their web browsers and going onto the web now can actually contribute back uh, and, and be a participant in 
the web experience, whether that's contributing content, whether that's voting on Dig, whether that's you know taking a video on YouTube and putting it somewhere else. It just they are having a, an everyday meaningful impact on what the web is. That to me is what Web 2.0 is all about. Where all the strands of Web 2.0 come together is in the new world of social networking, which was born in the wake of the dot-com crash. First came Friendster, a glorified dating site that rose and fell quickly, but that was followed by MySpace, founded in mid-2003 by two LA hipsters, Krista Wolf and Tom Anderson. The MySpace page is very similar to a person's bedroom or p- potentially their, their apartment, whereby um, on their MySpace page, there's you know different colors, there's music playing in the background, there's photos of your friends up, and it's very similar to what you may have in your, your bedroom or your apartment. It gives you this real insight into someone that ordinarily you wouldn't have. As it was with Napster, the initial popularity of MySpace had a lot to do with sharing and accessing music. By the spring of 2005, the site had gone through the roof, attracting 27 million registered users, growing at a blistering pace, and overtaking even the web's reigning colossus in terms of monthly traffic. When we passed Google and page views, I mean, that, that was a significant moment. It just seemed, wow, we can't be that big, you know? It just didn't seem right for us and the small company that we had. And, you know, Google was so huge and always in the news. And that was a very significant moment when that happened. By the summer of 2005, MySpace seemed to be everywhere. All of a sudden, every kid you met had a MySpace page. Every band had one, too. Hollywood had started using the site as a prime marketing vehicle for its wares. It didn't take a genius to see that MySpace was a potential goldmine. Although genius is exactly what many people attribute to Rupert Murdoch, the man who presides over the globe-spanning media empire that is News Corp, and who, that July, wrote a very big check to take over MySpace. At the height of the internet bubble, I had a conversation with Murdoch about the implications of the web. The old man poo-pooed it. Everyone's getting a bit overexcited by this digital deluge, he said. Most people just want to sit back and watch. Interacting is hard work. I remember thinking I'd finally found a blind spot in Murdoch. But then, a few years later, he turns around and buys MySpace for 650 million bucks. Had Murdoch, the god of old media, finally got the web religion? I don't think so. What happened was that the social networking tsunami simply got too big for Murdoch to ignore, and he figured it was time to start trying to ride the wave rather than getting drowned by it. But as News Corp would soon discover, on the internet, money can't buy you love or a permanent position of unchallenged dominance. The new, new thing is always just around the corner, and when it comes to social networking, the new, new thing is Facebook, a startup founded by the now 23-year-old Harvard dropout Mark Zuckerberg and which out in Silicon Valley is being mentioned by everyone in the same breath with Netscape and Google as a startup that has the potential to fundamentally change the web. So it started off pretty small, right? I mean, we threw together the first version of the, of the product in just a week and a half. Two-thirds of Harvard students were using it within a couple of weeks, right? And then all these other students from schools around Harvard started emailing us and saying, okay, well, can you open a version of Facebook at our school? And we just quickly expanded it as, as fast as we could. And then we expanded to all the colleges in the U.S., and then all the high schools, and then a lot of companies, and then we made it so that anyone can sign up. And then since then, it's grown from about 10 million active users to maybe 50, and it's still growing at this rate where it doubles every six months. This story might sound familiar, and in a way it is. Boy creates software in college dorm room. Software catches on, takes the web by storm. Boy moves out to Silicon Valley, climbs into bed with venture capitalists. Boy winds up on the cover of Fortune and makes so much money that you can't help but kind of hate him. But Mark Zuckerberg isn't just your typical Valley boy. What sets him apart is the sheer, ungodly, nearly incomprehensible scale of his ambition. It's the kind of ambition that reminds you of a young Bill Gates, who set out with the goal of putting a PC on every desktop and every home and office in the world, all of them running Microsoft software. Or the Google guys, whose goal is to organize and make accessible all the world's information via Google. In Zuckerberg's case, the grand ambition is to create a service that captures the totality of human connectedness. To create, I guess you'd say, the ultimate relationship engine. 
what we've tried to do at Facebook is we've tried to map out all of these relationships that people have. And I mean, there are billions of them across the world. And what we call the aggregate of all of the relationships that people have, we call that the social graph. The social graph may sound like another bit of Silicon Valley jargon, but it's not. It's actually a concept from academia, from what's known as social network analysis. The basic idea is that we're all bound together by a web of relationships. Some of the ties are direct and strong, others are tenuous and weak. I know you, you know a guy named Fred, and Fred happens to know Bono. So, theoretically, I'm connected to Bono. It's the six degrees of separation thing. Everyone's connected to everyone, however distantly. Now, imagine a diagram of all those interpersonal connections. That's the social graph. So when Zuckerberg talks about mapping, encompassing, and replicating online the entire sprawling global social graph, well, that's what I meant when I said before that he was unusually ambitious. Zuckerberg's ambitions don't end with the social graph, however. He wants to turn Facebook into the windows of the web, a platform on which software developers can build applications to make the site more useful and all-encompassing. And along the way, develop a whole new model of advertising. Well, I mean, the developer platform is something that happened really quickly. I mean, within the first four days of, of launching it, I don't know, this company I like, they built a music application, had more than a million users already. And stuff like that is just crazy. But I mean, it's, it was really interesting to see how quickly it grew. Though it's early days and many of the current Facebook applications aren't very useful, the potential of its platform can't be overstated. That's one big reason why Microsoft wasn't just willing, but eager to part with $240 million for just 1.6% of Zuckerberg's company late last year. Whether Zuckerberg will become the new Bill Gates of the web, of course, remains to be seen. For one thing, his new ad platform may flop. For another, MySpace is hardly giving up without a fight. Though Facebook is growing at a staggering rate, MySpace is still bigger. And DeWolf and Anderson, with Murdoch's backing, plan to take on Facebook head on. Thus are we about to witness the next great Donnybrook of the web. Facebook versus MySpace, the Valley Geeks versus the Hollywood Slicksters. But even with Rupert Murdoch lurking behind the scenes, bolstering MySpace as best he can, this is a novel kind of fight. Not old media versus new media, but new versus new. Two purebred Web 2.0 startups tangling for supremacy. A battle in which the most important creative assets are all of us, the amateurs. Which side will win? Maybe both, or maybe neither. With the rise of Web 2.0, everything is up for grabs. Money is flowing, deals are being done, millionaires are being minted overnight. But what's happening today also highlights the true significance of the web that first emerged way back in the days of Napster. The way it's put fantastic power in the hands of individuals. And while this power can be turned into profit, there are those whose aspirations are deeper, more altruistic. They're the people behind sites like Craigslist and Wikipedia people who can't be bought. As the traditional media have watched the emergence of the two-way web, their denizens have begun to wonder, and even fret, about the future of their industries and themselves. And among the most fretful have been my pals who work in places like this, in the world of professional journalism. For nothing epitomizes the democratizing tendencies of Web 2.0 more than that new form of expression we've come to know as blogging. All over the world, ordinary people are posting their thoughts, their rants, their expertise, and sometimes even their reporting on the web. Everyone has something to say, and suddenly anyone can be a citizen journalist. My reporter buddies aren't the only ones rattled by the rise of the two-way web, though. Their bosses, the publishers, are freaking out as well. Now, back in the day, and until very recently, newspaper publishers could kick back in their offices, comfortable in the knowledge that no matter whether the economy was up or down, they always had one reliable source of revenue, classified ads. But today, those same newspaper publishers aren't comfortable at all. Instead, they're trembling with fear every time one word gets mentioned. No, not internet, and not web. Instead, it's Craig. That's Craig as in Craigslist, one of the world's most popular websites, which acts as a kind of online notice board in 450 cities worldwide, complete with all the stuff you get in the classified section of any newspaper. Jobs, stuff for sale, stuff wanted, places to rent, places to buy, gigs, services, and of course, personals, many of them 
naughty. And the fact that its classifieds are free is why the newspaper publishers are in a tizzy. Considering the scale and global reach of Craigslist, surely the company behind it must occupy a vast and gleaming headquarters in the heart of Silicon Valley. And surely the man behind it all must be a rapacious billionaire, fierce and formidable and imposing. Or maybe not. Yep, here he is, Craig. Craig Newmark, to be precise, a cuddly, middle-aged ex-programmer who runs his free-to-use, free-to-post website out of this tiny San Francisco office, which was once his apartment. Like Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, the non-profit, user-generated web encyclopedia, Newmark is living proof that the web is not just about making money. It's about setting communication free. We uh, share some values with pretty much everyone in America and maybe everyone in the world. The deal is that, well, once you uh, make enough money to live comfortably and to provide for your future, what's the point in having uh, more? These are just the values we all get out of Sunday school or whatever when we grow up, and we're just following through. We're in an era when people are starting to realize that uh, communities, uh, self-supervising communities, can produce work of very high quality, whether that's uh, open source software or something like Wikipedia. Um, the openness, the transparency, that as long as you've got social rules in place that tend to encourage good work and to discourage bad things, um, the, the product that comes out is pretty good. As Wikipedia and Craigslist demonstrate, and as we see all around cyberspace, the web belongs to us. It's given us a megaphone to shout our views, however sane or crazy, trivial or profound, to show off our creativity to friends, family, and to utter strangers, to access media the way we want and say anything we please. What we're living through right now is the flow of power from a relatively small group of people to, in a sense, anyone who wants their little piece of power through the net. We went through the... The whole, uh, you know, dot-com bubble when the internet started to seem like it might be all about pop-up ads and selling dog food and things like this. Uh, and then this kind of harkens back to an earlier era. Which is to say the web is finally turning into what its originators always hoped for. Something that big business can never hope to control. The medium of the little guy. Don't believe me? Just ask the guy who invented it. Originally, the idea of the web was that it would be a two-way thing, that I would be able to contribute, and the web, over the last decade, has missed that. We are returning to the idea of a read-write web. So the fact that it's a space in which people can write a blog and contribute to a wiki is really exciting for me, because they bring back the common person as the author. And what of the future? Where is the web headed? Well, if I could answer those questions precisely, I'd be a billionaire. And I certainly wouldn't, under any circumstances, share the information with you. What I do know is the general direction of the changes that are coming for the web. Bigger, faster, more social, more pervasive. More all-consuming, more all-enveloping. Whether we like it or not, the web has taken on a life of its own. It's auto-catalytic. The dominoes have started their chain reaction, with many, many more to fall. <laughs>